Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Our text for our meditation this morning is taken from Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 15. He came to Derby, oh, 11 through 15, excuse me. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of the district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So far, our text. Dear Christian friends, there are some fantastic things we can do with modern medicine. And the first one that I want to talk to you about today is open heart surgery. They can actually cut open your chest, break your ribs, they saw through them with a saw, and they get to your heart, and they work on it. Sometimes they even put in a new heart. That's kind of the picture that our God gives here of what happened. Lydia opened her heart. It was amazing. Well, the Lord opened her heart. She got a brand new one. Dear friends, this morning we go forward under the theme, No Fear of Outreach. We're talking about the matters of the heart, and some of these can be kind of scary. Well, God opens the heart to receive the grace. And God also opens heart to respond to grace. We are on the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. And as you follow him, he is going up into modern-day Turkey, and he gets over to the left shore, the western shore, and he's about to just kind of hang out there because there are some huge cities that he wanted to go to. But when you read the book of Acts, the the verses just before our text, It says that the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to do so. And so Paul's not exactly sure where to go next, and he receives a vision. He receives a vision from the man of Macedonia, meaning going over to modern-day Greece, to go and preach there, and he's like, well, that's where I'm going next. So he gets in a boat, goes across, and that's where he goes to work. Now, this is kind of an interesting chunk because it's on the heels of what we talked about last week. Last week was Good Shepherd Sunday, and we talked about how we issue calls, how we get people into the public ministry, the representative ministry. And I said that I had not received a lightning bolt from God. Go to Winston-Salem. There was a group of Christians who were here who needed a pastor, and you called me through my church body, our church body, and then I came, and I've been here for 17 years. Now, Paul was actually knocked off his horse. Now, this was back when he was actually his conversion. But the same thing happened. He received a vision. That is possible. Probably won't happen. I don't know any of my colleagues who received a vision anytime soon to go to the place where they're supposed to go. But in this case, God did do that, which was okay. So it's kind of interesting case study that that's how God moved people around. Well, let's keep going. Um, This is, we are going, this is verse 12. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony in the leading city of the district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. There's a few things you should know about Philippi. First of all, it's a colony, meaning Rome wanted a city there. There wasn't one. So they planted one. You might say, well, how do you get people to go there? Well, if it's a Roman colony... If you fought in the Roman military, even if you were a slave, you earned your freedom, you earned money, and you earned land. And it was probably Philippi or one of the other Roman colonies. And so they sent these Roman soldiers there, and it was big. It was a leading city in the area. So if you're the Apostle Paul and you're walking through an area, 
he goes to a hub, a bigger city, and he does his work there, and the thought being, maybe somebody will hear my message here and then go out to the countryside and carry it with them. Kind of a trickle-down effect for the gospel. That's how it spreads. And I, I think I brought it up last week, but if you were at the LWMS rally, some people look at the world and there's six, seven billion people in the world now and that's just too overwhelming. Well, they showed a video and it was just a reminder of the power of exponents. I don't know how many math lovers we have in, in the congregation or watching online. But if I tell two people and then those people tell two people and on and on and on, how many days before you get to six billion? 22. Yeah. So it's a tall order, but it can go quickly. And your God knows this. So this is all about no fear of outreach, and I suppose <laughs> we're going to address those fears more directly in a second, but that's, it still works. Paul obviously had no fear of outreach, because that was his job as a missionary. We're going to try to put you guys to work as well by the time we're done. Well, let's jump into verse 13. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. Now, if you are the Apostle Paul and you go to a new city and you want to tell people about Jesus, where do you go first? What was his practice? He usually went to a synagogue. And a synagogue was the place where the Jews gathered and they opened up the Torah, the, the law, and they read from it. The reason he went there was because if you're going to an audience, or let's say that you want to sell cars, you probably want to sell to someone who wants a car, right? If you're going to tell someone about the Savior of the world, the whole purpose of the Jewish race was to receive Jesus. So these are people who may not have gotten the message. They didn't have nightly news that went all across the Mediterranean. Maybe they didn't hear that Jesus lived, died. And so a lot of times he walked in the, into the synagogue, told them, and they're like, wow, that's fantastic. Well, what's the problem with the Roman colony of Philippi? There is no synagogue. There weren't enough Jews, and so he went down by the river. Because that's where he did find a place of prayer. Because historically, if there's no synagogue, what do these Jews do? They go down by the river. And he found people who were looking for that message. And Paul encouraged them, and all the more, he told them who their Savior was. It was fantastic. So, <clears throat> what's next? Well, he finds a woman who's a dealer in purple. Now, we've come a long way, I suppose, but we don't deal in colors. Do you know why there, you could be a dealer in purple? It's because purple was not an easy color to make. The reason why kings wore purple is because nobody else did. To make purple, you had to take this little snail and smush it, and then the dye that came from that was purple. And so in the ancient world, it was a painstaking process, but yet if you were good at it, there was money to be made. And the woman that, we're, that is the focus of our text here is Lydia. She was a dealer in purple, and she was a successful businesswoman, and she was looking for the Lord. Now, one other little piece of information here. This is verse 14. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, dealer in purple from the city of Thyatira. She was not from Israel. There are many who think that she was a convert to Judaism just because she wasn't from Israel. Maybe she heard about it. Maybe there was a synagogue there. And yet she didn't know who Jesus was. And so she only knew about half the story, and she's eagerly waiting and expecting. And when Paul shows up, her mind is blown, and she loves it. And that's fantastic. Now, one of the things people ask, what was Paul's message exactly? We don't really know. So let me give you an example. And this is kind of important for our purposes today. Because this is No Fear of Outreach Sunday. The Jews... Probably Lydia were familiar with their Old Testament. And let's say that he went into the book of Isaiah. And he went to the passage that Jesus would, would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. She knew that and she loved it. Those are the names of God. And this is an opportunity to plug our early Bible study on Sundays, the names of God. You can join us in person or on Zoom. 
There are links on our website to do so. It's a lot of fun because we go all over the Bible looking at these different names of God. There's hundreds. Well, some of these names are an open door for the Apostle Paul to show her this person whom you heard about in the Old Testament came. His name is Jesus. And he suffered and died for your sins. Now, that's just one example. And I give you that example, not because I think Paul actually used it. He may have. But to kind of put into your minds, what would you do if someone came up to you down by the river and they asked you, what do you believe? Where do you go to church? Why do you do that? Could you give, in just a few sentences, the reason for the hope that you have? What would you say? And I'm going to be the first one to tell you, it takes practice. <laughs> if you don't do this normally, just a, so when I first married my wife, okay, I, I don't know that I've said the word wife a lot before I married my wife. And so when I introduced Jenna, I said, this is Jenna, she's my woo, woo. she's my wife. I wasn't ashamed of it, but this was not something... So I think I even practiced it. So the next time I met someone and I could introduce my gorgeous wife, it'd roll off my tongue. You might need some practice witnessing because it's new and it's different. How often does the name Jesus cross your lips? Do you have that rehearsed in your head exactly what you're going to say? Because part of, so people say, how can I do this? Well, I've been doing this for 17 years, so it's not that hard. But even when I first started, well, my personality thinks this is kind of fun, and it's exhilarating, so it's not that hard. But for you, this might be terrifying. So maybe there's another way, another way that you can help, another way that you can maybe, well, go to Google and leave a five-star review. If you're watching online, do it for your church or for ours, because that's how we keep on bumping up. And the front page of your church the front door, excuse me, is your Google search. It's your website. People will check you out online before they come visit you. And that's okay, but those are ways, even if you don't want to say a word, one way that you can have no fear of outreach and open up hearts is just do that little search engine optimization help of leaving a five-star review. You can like a post on Facebook. You can share a sermon with your friend. You can forward on an email. All of those things anybody can do. And there's different ways you can pitch in. If you don't want to talk to anyone, could you pass out food at a food pantry? All of our events are going to start wrapping up at the end of May, and I'm excited because I'll get to meet more people. You can help in any one little way with those. And it's a very real impact. Well, <laughs> let's keep going. The Lord opened her heart to respond to the message. Now, we talked about open heart surgery. I got to show you, this is a little baby who is in the UK. This is circa 2017, not long ago. He was born with a congenital heart defect. And uh, the doctor said he could live a little bit and it would take open heart surgery, but they did it. They, they, they fixed. There's something wrong with one of the valves exactly. I don't know. This little boy's name is Bobby. And shortly after Bobby's surgery, dad got a tattoo. Bobby's doing well, by the way. The, the, the dad's name is Daniel. Well, dad got a tattoo to show that he wasn't alone. His son wasn't alone because he wanted to go through something similar. Now, a tattoo is not nearly as bad as having your heart ripped, you, you know, open and the ribs cracked, but that's a good dad. He's trying. And I got to say, your father is fantastic because he gave up Jesus. Because when you see that scar... Yes, you have an open heart, and yes, he gave you a new one, but it's far more than a tattoo, those scars that Jesus has. He still has them, and that's the proof that he paid for your sins and the sins of the world. And that's a powerful reminder that God opens hearts every day. He did that for you, and he'll do it with your words. And if you're not confident in your words, he might be able to use your actions too. Well, <laughs> listen to verse 15. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. 
If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Um, Missionary Duncan is, uh, serves an eastern part of the world. I don't even want to say exactly where. But he, he shared stories about people who were brand new Christians, who had literally risked their lives. And some of the stories he told were just horrifying, how people were beaten for being Christian or whatever. And he, they almost demanded that Missionary Duncan stay at their homes. They had nothing. And yet he went finally because it's almost embarrassing the fifth time that they insist and offer because they loved so much that message that they were given. And I just want to communicate to you how much fun it is for me to share that exact same message and the thanks that people have that I get to share with them who their Savior is and encourage them. That can be yours as well. I don't have a license talk about Jesus. I mean, I do. God gave it to me, but he gave it to you as well. There's nothing special about what I have. So, I I want you to consider whom you could speak with. No fear of outreach. Well, that starts, I suppose, as you walk out these doors. One of the churches that I visited when I was at the seminary had Um, a banner, or I forget if it was painted on the wall, and it said, you are entering into the mission field. And I don't have that up there. I should have done that for this Sunday. So when you get up and you turn around and you walk out, you are aware as you go to lunch, as you go to Costco, wherever it is you go as you leave these doors, as you go back to school, you are entering the mission field. And my friends, don't have any fear. No fear of outreach, because it's God who opens up those hearts. He opens them up to receive the grace. And just like Lydia, he opens them up to respond to the grace. And it is fantastic to watch those respond to faith. Amen. Please stand. Christ Jesus. We praise our God with this song printed in your worship folder.